Tonight, we are going to look at the word saved again. This is uh, the third part in our series, uh, fourth part, I guess, if you count, we broke one of them up into two pieces. Um, third part, uh, we have been saved, past tense, we are being saved, present tense, and we will be saved, future tense. Tonight, we're going to look at the future tense, we will be saved. And I hope you enjoy it. If you like what you are learning uh, from our Bible studies, please click on the thumbs up below and uh, share it with your friends. Let's get started. starting welcome to our class on the word saved remember uh, we have studied uh, we have been saved a past event that happened at the cross and that made us uh, got the sin out of us legally and then uh, part of that double cure we were declared not guilty um, but we were also purified our souls that got the sin out of us spiritually and then uh, last week when we looked at um, we are in the process of being saved that gets the sin out of us physically. It's a practical way to drive out sin and to um, kill the flesh and kill evil desires to take on more and more of the heavenly desires. It's kind of like the process of living up to what we've already been declared. And then uh, tonight is we are removed from the presence of sin. We will be saved. When we get to heaven, there will be no presence of sin, not in our new bodies, and there will be no temptation. Um, we can't, we don't know what that's like. We do not know what it is like to live without the presence of sin, either from the sin of someone else or the sin of ourselves. We don't know what it's like not to be tempted, but all of that is removed when we will be saved. I, I love this uh, idea. I'm looking forward to it. I know uh, Kim Dupero, um, you know, she, her body was breaking down, had cancer, and she got to go home. And so she had a great homecoming. She got a new body. And there is no more cancer, but there's also no more sin or temptation. So, you know, all the flaws that we have are completely removed. And all the good things, we just keep growing in the, the good qualities we have in Christ, in our character. Uh, I just love that. So we're looking at uh, being, being saved, or we will be saved tonight. Here is what the worksheet looks like. For those of you watching at home, and if you didn't have it, um, we're talking about the future sense, future tense of this word saved. And uh, to start us off, we're going to look at Romans chapter 5, verse 9, and that's going to help use that future tense. Don't forget, you have to unmute yourself when you go to read for us tonight. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Oh, I love that. See, there's that, there's that present tense. You shall be saved. That's, that's going to be, I mean, the future tense. That's something that's going to happen in the future. God's wrath is being revealed now, the consequence of sin that we live in, the consequence of our own actions. But he has wrath stored up where he is going to pour out in judgment on the sin that is not taken care of in Christ. And we will be saved from that. That's, that's the future tense of that word there. So it is used in that way in the scripture. Now we're going to look at what happens during these, this future um, salvation. And so we have three verses that go along with that. Matthew chapter 25, uh, Romans 13, and 2 Timothy 4.18. So what we're going to do tonight, uh, you just read your verse, and we'll, we'll, I might have you read it twice, and then we'll go to the next one in the next three. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, Romans 13.11, and 2 Timothy 4.18. Go ahead and read. Then they will go away to internal punishment, but the righteous to internal life. Then it's a future, a future, future time. Okay, good. Okay, Romans um, thirteen eleven, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from the slumber, because our salvation is newer now than when we was, or I'm sorry, than when we first believed 
Okay, um, that translation, I like that. I hadn't heard that before. It's newer now. Another translation said it's closer. Our salvation is closer than when we first believed, as in it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And, you know, we, we have this conversation. I thought I already was saved. Well, the answer is yes, you have already been saved. I thought I was being saved. Well, yes, you are being saved. But it, it hasn't arrived yet? Well, yes, it hasn't arrived yet. In um, the scripture, especially in the New Testament, there is the now but not yet. We've had the inauguration of the new kingdom. Jesus came, inaugurated, he started it. He said, the kingdom is now here with me, but it's not completely consumed everything. There's kind of a great crossing over um, as the new kingdom is designed to drive out the old kingdom and eventually it's gonna take over everything. That's, that's part of our jobs. We're setting up camps now of the new kingdom. We're supposed to be ambassadors. Uh, Tim Mackey has a great uh, video about how um, there's this overlap of the heavenly kingdom here on earth, God's will done on earth as it is in heaven, and it's brought about by our actions and our attitudes and our words, and we're driving back the darkness. We are being light and salt, and eventually uh, we won't have to work so hard. God's just going to make it all happen, but in the meantime, we have a role to play in that, and uh, it is going to happen. It's closer than it was before, and 2 Timothy 4.18, who has that one? I don't remember who I gave it to you. Oh, don't forget, you have to unmute yourself. Kathy, is it you? Okay, try it now. Okay. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Uh, again, he says, will rescue this all leads us to, to think about what this fill in the blank will be. I, I know what word I picked here, but it's going to happen in the future. It's closer than ever before, and it's going to have, we will rescue and we will be moved into the heavenly kingdom. What future blank would we use here? What do we think that's going to be? Future blank. You have to unmute to guess. We'll take the best guess. I have a word in mind. Um, that we can think about, but go on and unmute, and uh, you can tell me what you think your word is. Judy, you always have good words. The problem. Oh, I un I unmuted you. Try it okay. now. I was thinking peace. Future peace. Oh, that's a good word. That's a good word. Uh, who else? Who else has a word? The future life. Oh, future life is good. Those are yeah. all good words. I'm going to put both of those in there. Future peace, future life. Uh, the word I was going to think of was this is going to be at a future event. There is going to be a time and place where that happens. But it is when we were going to get peace. It is where we're going to get a new life. Uh, but there is an event that is going to take place. It, when Christ comes back, that is the moment. When we studied Revelation, we used the idea that when Jesus comes back the second time, that's, that's, the, that's the event where everything changes. Um, and the way we read Revelation, the way we understood it, there. We couldn't find a tribulation. We didn't find a seven-year period. We didn't find any of that stuff. We found Jesus came back, and it was over and, um, and changed, and we get to be changed. Paul says some of us will be changed in a twinkling of an eye when Jesus mm -hmm. comes back. Uh, okay, we're going to move on to the uh, next section, and this is a future sharing. Now, I think you're going to be able to guess what this one is. Uh, I have two that mention the word. And one that's designed to throw you off, but it means the same thing. So we're going to read Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 18. And there's a future sharing that goes on. And we have to figure out what that sharing is. Oh, hold on. Let me mute. Let me mute Judy. We can't have that, Judy. <laughs> okay, here we go. Who has Romans chapter 8, verse 16? 16. You want me to read? Uh, who has Romans 8.16? Yeah. Okay, Judy. No, yeah, I got that one. The Spirit himself bears... Wait, 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 wait. We, we're all curious. Who called? Sherry. Somebody <laughs> called. I'm just kidding. We didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> it was very important. <laughs> Go ahead. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 18. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children heirs also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him in or uh, 
in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us, the sufferings. Good, thank you. So we had a couple of words in there. Remember, we're looking for this uh, fill-in-the-blank future, sharing a blank. We're going to be fellow heirs. We're going to suffer with, and we're going to share with, and that's the fill-in-the-blank. What we got? Who has Second Thessalonians? I think that's Connie. Oh, I have Second Timothy. Connie, you ready? You have to unmute yourself, but I think you have Second Thessalonians chapter two. Connie, you're still on on mute, but I did ask to unmute you. Maybe there's a button on your screen. Oh, there you are. You're ready. You're with us. I am. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I lost my place. Oh, I'm yeah. glad you're here. Oh, no. I, wait. Just, just wait a minute. Just 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 Beautiful minute. skylight. I'm sorry. Oh, gosh. Good grief. I'm a Nettie. I'm sorry. We don't use that kind of language around here, Connie. Good grief and crime and medic. Second Thessalonians really chapter 2. Okay, Second okay, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. He verse, 14, you, verse 14, verse 14. Right. I'm sorry. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that might have given it away, Connie. That was a good one. Okay, be thinking about what we're sharing in. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. Same meaning, but different words. We endure. We, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Good, thank you. Okay, that might have thrown you off. What do we think we share in Christ? His glory. Oh, Rusty, you figured it out straight away. We're going to share in the, the glory of Christ. That's what two of our verses says. And it says we are going to reign with him. This is incredible. This is incredible. God does not share his glory. God's glory is his alone. No way does he share it with a little peon like me. But the, the scripture says we are going to share in his glory and we are going to reign with him. This blows my mind. I cannot imagine how awesome that is that Jesus Christ lifts me up to be with him in the heavenly realms. And then I get to rule with him, reign with him. This was kind of the design of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were meant to rule in the name and place of God under God's authority. And they were supposed to have dominion and they blew it. And uh, we probably would have too. Um, the temptation to run things our own, we just all fall for that. But... Jesus promises we are going to be re-established in that original plan to share in his glory and reign with him. Uh, any comments on that? Has anybody ever heard that before? I remember the first time I heard that I was going to share in the glory of Jesus, and I just listened to a lesson about God does not share his glory with anyone because he is God alone. He's still God alone, but he invites us in. What do you think about that? Who's got some thoughts on that or a comment? Uh, put, yeah, Jeannie, go ahead. Well, when I first heard it, I mean, my thought was we were going to share as all of us, but his glory. I mean, you were, you know, we were, <laughs> it, it, right. we were separated sort of like he's up here and, and we're all just going to be worshiping and sharing in his glory. And then I realized, I think we're not just, I think he's inviting us even closer than that, than I originally thought. That we were supposed to. Oh, I think you're right on. When he says in Revelation, he is going to be with us and us with him. Jesus says this too, that you may be where I am. We're, mm -hmm. We are going to be with him. You know, I'm at, sometimes I like to think that, you know, we have, some of us have that picture of God in the sky as the big Santa. He's got the big beard and invites, you know, Jesus, I can just see him inviting us into his lap, onto his lap, just to hang out with him. Um, and, and reign with him. I don't know how exactly that works as we serve him, as we're still a priest in heaven. Uh, but this is this idea, Jeannie, you're right. We get to be closer than just he's up there and we're down here. We get to join with him. That's, that's incredible. Blows my mind. Who else? Comment. If we are reigning with him, who are we reigning over? Oh, that's a good question. Good question. Um, 
somewhere in there, I don't know how this all works, but somewhere in there, um, somebody said, don't you know, we will judge angels. I don't know how, how that works. Um, and I don't know, maybe, you know, there's this idea that when we get to heaven, we get rewarded based on kind of the responsibility we took on earth. Uh, so maybe we have, imagine a perfect, a perfect city that we still elect a mayor to kind of run and uh, organize and administrate, but there's no like backbiting or gossip or um, malcontent or evil thoughts or temptation. So I don't, you know, it's hard for us to start imagining what that would look like. Maybe a president who has good character and seeks to do God's will. It's weird. We have no idea what that might look like, but as a political joke, nobody laughed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you laughed. The delayed laughter. Thank you. Thank you. We have no idea what that's going to be like, but um, there's a sense of that in the scripture. We huh. we get a sense of what the reward is, but you know the reward is probably greater than what we can imagine, and God reveals it in words that we can understand. But it's probably better than than what we can kind of think it is. Any other comments or questions about reigning with Christ? Judy, you've heard a share in his glory before. What Have you ever been taught about that in any way? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very helpful. Thank you. Was, yeah, I'm so helpful. Anybody else? I'm not, I'm not with it. <laughs> anybody else shocked by that? It'll be wonderful. It'll just be, you know, wonderful. It'll be so wonderful we won't even, we yeah. can't even imagine it. Yeah, my friend so Kim, wonderful. she doesn't want to come back here. You know, as sad as her husband and her friends are, she's like, well, I'll just wait up here for you, you know. <laughs> uh, who who heard that for the very first time tonight, that we get to share in his glory? Everybody already heard that before. Okay. It's still pretty cool, even if you've heard it before. Okay. We're... I've heard it before, but I can't explain it. Oh, yeah. Good, John. Good. I'm glad you heard Where have you heard it before, John? Probably in sermons over the years that I've been around listening to them. John, I always imagine that your basket is talking to us. <laughs> yes. Through many sermons over the years. And your basket is saying that. That's what I imagine in my head. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've heard it before, but it's hard to explain, sir. Right, we don't have... Uh, when, yeah. you say we're, when you say we're going to be ruling up there, I can't imagine who we're going to be ruling over when Christ is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but he we're going to be bound the knee to Him. Yes, and we throw our crowns down to Him. Any any accolades we get, we just give them to Jesus. And yet, He always works through His people on Earth. He's always wanted to do that from the beginning. Adam and Eve, God wanted to work through them. Um, he gives us real responsibility. He gives us real choices, and there and it's an incredible dignity that He gives us. Um, and we can't explain it. Let's, let's how, about the, how about this? Yes, sir. To me now? Yes, sir. In his model prayer, he says, I will be done as it is. I believe it in this respect. He says, I will be done on earth. And I have this concept that it's already being done in heaven. Yes. So and it, will not change, it will not alter or change. So we have this idea, like I mentioned before, it's now and not yet. It has started, right. but it, it's not to the full fruition. It's not complete yet. Yes. I, I agree. I agree. Process. We're moving into future deliverance. I already filled in that word for you. But what do we get delivered from? And I have uh, several fill in the blanks of when we are saved in the future, we're going to be delivered from something that we have to navigate and endure and struggle through right now. And so who has Revelation 21, 1 through 7? Now, this is a long one, and we have to kind of uh, make a, a guesstimation on what this word is because it doesn't say it specifically. So uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Okay. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself 
will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Very good. Thank you so much for reading that. That's one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Do you remember in our Revelation class, where it says uh, what that sea represented, it was a symbol. There, God is not saying there's no water in heaven. What did the sea represent in Revelation? It started evil and chaos, right, Judy? Thank you. Yeah. So if we go all the way back to Genesis, it says, you know, the, the Spirit of God hovered over the wild and waste, the water, the evil and chaos that's there. And then in Genesis chapter 1, God begins to put order into the evil and chaos. And so that idea of the water representing evil and chaos was really big in, um, in the apocryph apocryphal literature that Jews wrote uh, about the turn of the century and a little bit before. And so when we encounter Revelation, the very first scene we see of those, this, this big expanse of sea is in the throne room of God, but it's totally calm. Because in the presence of God, he calms evil. We, we have a picture of that when Jesus calms the sea. But in the throne room of God, Revelation chapter 4 and 5, the sea is totally calm. Then we are introduced to the sea a little bit later, chapter 13. The beast comes out of the sea, out of that evil and chaos. And then the next time we see the sea, it is on fire because God is judging all the evil and pouring out his wrath on evil. And then we get to chapter 21. There's no more sea. Well, what does that mean? He has delivered us from every single evil, chaotic, sinful time life he's delivered us from sin and so when we when we fill in this blank here and put he's delivered us from sin we can say he's delivered us from evil from chaos and from sin evil chaos and sin totally gone forever well as as genie kept reading you know the the basis of all of our ten, sin i'm sorry the basis for all of our tears and pain and suffering emotional, physical, and spiritual. It's all based on evil and chaos. And God has removed that completely. It will happen in the future. This is part of what we're delivered from when it says, I will be saved. Um, remember, this, this salvation where everything is removed and all things are made new is closer than it was before. He's going to move, rescue us from this world and put us into the heavenly kingdom. We will be fellow heirs with Christ. He's called to share called us to share in his glory and we will reign with him in this future place with no evil no chaos and no sin this is incredible i love this idea i love this idea okay who has revelation 21 4 we're also delivered because evil and chaos are removed we're also delivered from something very specifically he mentions here 21 okay i got it okay. he will wipe away every tear from their eyes there will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Okay, if you only get to put one word in that blank out of what he just read, we're going to read it again, so we just get to use one. What would you say we're delivered from? Death. Okay, you want to say death first? No. Well, that's not first, but... <laughs> we can put death there, because we got... Pain. Pain. He mentions, he mentions the tears and pain first, um, so let's put it in there first. Pain and tears, we're, that's what we're delivered from, because evil and chaos and sin, that's what causes our tears and pain. And then, Jeannie, the next one, just like you said, we are delivered from death. This is the last thing we're delivered from, it says in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, you know, he's, we're going to get new bodies. These bodies have to be planted in the ground, just like a seed. The new heavenly bodies don't kind of, you know, anything mm -hmm. like the the uh, earthly bodies, and, but we're going to be delivered from death. It's the last thing that is defeated, or the last thing we get to experience the defeat of. And I also like this thought. This is kind of a, a Dallas Willard uh, taught me this. Um, 
he said, you know, Jesus says those who trust in him will never taste death. And it, it makes me start thinking, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we're scared about that transition. We don't know what the transition is like. And, um, and we can see as people approach death, we see that they're suffering. But when death hits, if we're in Christ, we don't taste that. And so Dallas Willard used to teach that he, he believes that if he is still in his right mind when he passes, he won't notice that he's passed into the next life for a couple of seconds. He won't realize that he died because his thinking is going to continue on and his conscience was going to continue on. And all of a sudden, he's just in another place. Uh, C.S. Lewis described it like uh, walking into the next room. That's the transition of death. We will not taste death if we're in Christ. That doesn't mean we won't necessarily endure the suffering that leads up to death, but we've seen that. We can endure that. Um, but we, what we don't know is about that transition. And Jesus says, hey, we don't even have to worry about the transition. You won't taste it if you're in me. I love that idea. I love that thought. Can you imagine you're, you're breathing, but you're, you've got trouble breathing. Uh, you, you take that last gasp here on earth, and then all of a sudden you take your next breath of that sweet, heavenly, I don't know what it's going to be like. It's going to be the purest air we've ever breathed. I don't know if we're even going to need to breathe air, but it'll be so sweet. And our conscience just moves from this to the next. And we get a new body, see Jesus face to face. We celebrate. Maybe we'll dance for a thousand years. Maybe we'll paint for a thousand years. Maybe we'll drive uh, stock cars for a thousand. I don't know what it's going to be like, um, but it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And we won't, but we'll, we're delivered from death. That's the main point that I just rambled on about. Um, any thoughts on that before we move on? John? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Uh, this word elimination comes into my mind. He eliminates tears. He eliminates death. He eliminates mourning. He eliminates crying pain. It's all gone, removed, eliminated. I call it eliminated. I love um, it. I love it. It's eliminated. I always, I can't never remember if I spell eliminate with an E or an I. E. E. Well, we can put that in there, John. Let me see what I can do here. Let's see. Insert, shape, bracket. There. That's good. Okay. So far, insert. Uh, where, let's see. We want to insert a text box just like that. We're going to put that over here. Make it really small. Follow along, everybody. You can do this at home, too, if you want. Okay, eliminate. How about elimination? Elimination. It doesn't fit in my text box. Okay, we did it. <laughs> elimination. I'll take it. I love it. Thank you, John. Elimination. Elimination of evil. Elimination of chaos. Elimination of sin. Elimination of pain, tears, death. It's gone. John, I love it. Thank you. Who's got Romans 8, 22 through 25? Evan. Go ahead. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves have the first, first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly, um, as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption, redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Cecil, that was excellent reading. Will you read it one more time? What we're looking for, what we're looking for, there's two parts here. We're going to be delivered from all of these blank, and we're going to be delivered from this blank. <clears throat> Thinking about those two fill in, fill in blanks, Cecil, please read it one more time for us. Sure. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Thank you. Okay, who wants to get? We are delivered from these what? What do we have redemption of? Bodies. Bodies. We're delivered, bodies. We're delivered from our bodies. We get new bodies. Earth. Yes. I got this pain in my shoulder. It never goes away. My new body is not going to have that. 
it's yeah. not going to have it. Um, anybody else experience aches and pains they're ready to get rid of? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Our bodies are crying out. What else is crying out to be delivered? He mentioned it. He said it twice. Anybody remember? Well, the, let's see. He said it right at the beginning of the passage. Groaning. <laughs> Yeah, what is what is groaning? Creation. Yeah, we're delivered from this earth. We get a new earth, one that's not broken, one that's not torn up. You know, Jesus, Jesus, and you know, God is the first person to care more about the environment than any person here on earth, and He has a plan for it. His plan is to recreate it because this environment has been broken by sin. I I don't know what a tree is going to look like without mar marring by sin. I don't know what um, our rivers and oceans will be like without being marred by sin. I, I, can't, I, I can't imagine. We get a picture of it in Revelation just a little bit. He tells us in words we can understand, but I don't think it does it justice. He cares about the environment. He wants us to care about the environment. That's fine because we're supposed to reign in his place, be his ambassadors. Um, so we're supposed to take care of the things around us just like we take care of each other. But God is going to rescue us from this broken world. Um, Sometimes we, we think that we can preserve our own bodies. You know, you, have, you've met the people who try to make their bodies be like perfectly in health, and then all of a sudden they get a cold and they're sick and devastated and they can't believe it. Um, that's happening with the coronavirus. You know, some people are getting it and they're perfectly healthy and then all of a sudden their bodies are destroyed. And then we have some people who are unhealthy. They don't eat right. They don't sleep right. They don't exercise right. They get the coronavirus. They just have a fever and they just keep on ticking. Um, but the whole thing is broken. We don't need a, a simple repair for our body. We need a new body. And we don't need a simple repair for the earth, although we do the best we can. We need a new earth that is not broken by sin. And we're going to be delivered by that when Jesus comes back. So in the meantime, we take care of our bodies the best we can. We take care of the earth the best we can. But we are looking forward to those new earth, new body that we're, gonna, that we're going to inhabit. One that is not marred by sin, one that doesn't have temptation in it. And we're removed from the presence of sin. I am looking forward to that. Amen. Let us look real quick um, at this verse, and then we're going to come back to D. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 through 4 we're made like, who's got that one to read? I do. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have his, this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Oh, this is another one of my favorite Bible verses. When we see him, we will be like him. When Jesus comes back, when we are saved, we're going to be like him. We're going to be made like him. We're going to get new bodies like him. Uh, we're going to, I don't, I still can't fathom it. It's just incredible to me. When we see him, we'll be made like him. Now we kind of know what he's like. We kind of see what he's like. We can kind of move toward that idea of being like him. And uh, we take on more and more of the character of Christ, more and more of the actions of Christ, more and more of the thoughts of Christ. But when we see him, we'll be made like him. Oh, that's going to be good. Can you imagine having the character of Jesus, but having your own personality? You don't lose your personality when you get to heaven. Isn't that going to be good? All the good things about me, I get to carry on. All the bad things, they get destroyed. I'm eliminated, John. Uh, they're eliminated from me. I'm looking forward to that. Um, any any uh, thoughts or comments before we hit our last section? Section D. Cecil, I see your family leaving back there. Hey, Brady. Hey, Jenna. I see you. Hey, Kathy. Any thoughts on being made like Christ? Fantastic. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> it is. It will be wonderful. Judy, what you say? Fantastic. Fantastic. You want to go up, not down? Can't wait. Wait, who said that? What? Somebody said something. Can't wait. I said you want to go up, not down. Oh, we want to go up, not down. That's right. I thought maybe <laughs> that was John's basket that spoke. <laughs> not sure if that's part of the lesson, but that's what Brady always teaches us. <laughs> go up, not down. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. <laughs>
our last section, last section, we're going to turn, we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 17. And in that verse, um, God uh, teaches us a contrast between Revelation 17 and Revelation 21. And uh, I, this was one of my favorite things I, I got, I was taught when I did the study on Revelation. And um, when I did the study on Revelation, I didn't get to teach this lesson as well as I wanted to, to the whole church. So Revelation 17 gives us the picture of the, what's called the whore of Babylon. And in uh, that picture, um, what, uh, what John is trying to give to us is that the beast, the worker of Satan and his prophet, are going to use the, all the tricks of this world to try to entice us. And uh, all the tricks of the political system and the, uh, all the stuff that we can own, everything that might entice us. And it is good. It's good stuff. God says, hey, you can use all of creation for your pleasure, but, but don't let the pleasure rule over you. And so um, the devil takes that and he says, well, I'm going to use these pleasurable things and I'm going to make them rule over you. They're going to be trapped by sin in them. They're going to become your idol. They're going to become your um, addiction. Um, and then, so what John does is he sets up the whore of Babylon as this uh, good thing. But when we start looking behind the scenes and see what it really is, we, we should be disgusted by it and we should reject it and not latch on to what the world offers. Listen to how he, how he describes um, this, the Babylon. Now remember um, to, to the Jewish culture, any, any culture, city, nation that came in and kind of oppressed the Jews or, 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 or um, kind of ruled the world in a mean spirited way like Rome did, they'd call another Babylon. And so John is talking about the city of Rome. He's talking about the culture of Rome. The culture of Rome was merciless. You ruled by might. Um, there was this thing called the Pax Romana, the peace Rome spread. Well, they spread it by being merciless and they killed anybody who got in their way. And so um, that was how they spread peace. If you didn't join in, they just killed you. And all of a sudden they had peace from you because you died. This, this was the culture. And, and listen to how John describes it. Um, it says, verse 3 of, of chapter 17, Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and, seven, and ten horns. But listen, the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet. She was wealthy. You know, that wealth of the world entices us and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. And, you know, we love... We love precious stones and pearls and gold. And, um, but when we start seeing behind the scenes, it's really, we start realizing it's kind of like rhinestones, a rhinestone jacket. All that glitters isn't gold, and, but she's offering us gold. And this is one of the tricks the beast used. And um, she has pearls. Now that, that's really incredible in Jesus's day. Because how do you get pearls? You have to dive down deep underwater. You have to get the clams that have the pearls. You have to take the pearls out. Well, they didn't have scuba equipment. So pearls were very valuable. And so there's all these valuable things on earth that can entice us, that trap us, that trick us. And the whore of Babylon, she's offering, hey, you just come my way. You can have all that I offer you. Kind of like the same temptation the devil offered Jesus. Just bow down and worship me. You can have all these nations. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to sacrifice anything. Just bow down. You can have it. And, uh, and we are offered that same temptation. Then we jump over to chapter 21, where we see the city. And the city is a contrast to what Rome offered. Now, I know you already know this answer. So the, the whore of Babylon, Rome, had pearls and glittered with gold. What is the city of God made out of? Gold. 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 The whole thing's gold. So we can trade like for little baubles or we can have it all, you know, if we go with Christ. And does anybody remember? I think you will remember. What are the gates made out of? Pearl. They're made pearl. Of, the whole gate is a pearl. We don't have to have like a pearl. We don't have to have like a handful of pearls. We have the whole pearl as big as a gate. Uh, the pearl is. And what John is trying to tell us here is whatever we give up on earth for Jesus, whatever we sacrifice on earth for Jesus, whatever we think we are not getting because we're following Jesus, we get it back a hundred times more and better, a hundred times better in, in heaven. If we can patiently endure here, don't think of it as a sacrifice where you're missing out on something. 
Think of it as a sacrifice where you're just patiently enduring until you get something better. We are going to get so much better than the, what this world has to offer. So don't get trapped by the world. We, there's a lot of good things in the world. There's a lot of things I enjoy in the world, but don't get trapped by them. Use them, enjoy them, praise God for them. But don't, get, don't let them become your idol because whatever we give up for Jesus here, we get to take even better in Christ. That's the contrast John is making here between the city of, of Rome, which he calls Babylon, the whore of Babylon, and the city of God. Um, anybody remember how we win in Revelation? We win by remaining faithful to the end. And remaining faithful by the, to the end through suffering. And Re Revelation chapter 12 says we, re we win by the sacrifice and blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. That's what we get to be. We get to be living sacrifices here. We get to take up our own cross. We get to deny ourselves a lot of the pleasures of earth because we are waiting patiently for Jesus to come back. But remember, you're not missing out. It's going to be even better if you are faithful and you endure here. I have a friend of mine who uh, believes, um, my friend believes the, the life purpose for them is to travel to every country. They haven't been able to go anywhere because of coronavirus. And my friend thinks they are missing out and are going to ruin their whole dream and never be able to see the earth and never be able to see the countries. And gosh, when we get to heaven, don't you think God's virtual reality room is like reality reality and you can visit anywhere you want to go visit? It, uh, we're not missing out if we don't get to do it here. So if, if you don't get to travel because you spent your money to feed somebody that was poor or you don't get to go and have, live in a mansion because you made sure somebody had clothes and you made sure, some, sure somebody else had shelter, your mansion in heaven is going to be so much better than what you gave up here. There's a reason why Jesus says in Luke, hey, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to give away your stuff here because we're going to get it better when we get to heaven. We're delivered from evil. We're delivered from chaos, but we are delivered into riches beyond what we can imagine. We get to inherit the heavenly realms. John, what do you need to say? Uh, I don't know if any of your congregation, wife and I got to go to the Bahamas one time. and. You think about heaven, the glow, the glory is forever. It's eternal, or if I can use that phrase, well, it's, it's never ending. Yes. It's a lot better than the Bahamas. <laughs> or Hawaii, no, that's hard to imagine. <laughs> I use that as an illustration. Well, John, your, I, have your a, congregation. Huh? I have a suggestion. Uh, since we're all here, just us in our in our Bible study, why don't you let us you you buy us a ticket all to the Bahamas, every one of us, and we'll experience it, and you can you can tell us what it's like, and we'll know what it's like. We'll know what you're talking about. I've never been to the Bahamas, John. I'm gonna have to have you uh, buy me the ticket so we can go. Just buy one for all of us. We'll cover our hotel. We'll cover our food. You just get us there. Can I put that on the Master Card? Uh, your Master Card. Yeah. <laughs> Big one. That was clever. That was very clever. John, I think I think you're right. It is if we think of our paradise on earth and the best place we've ever been, um, heaven is going to be that much greater. So I think you're I think you're exactly right. Hawaii is pretty nice too. Oh, Judy, same same offer. You can buy us all a ticket. Help okay. us get there. Um, I don't know what Hawaii is like, so I need to go. I need somebody. Hawaii? No, I need some. I need you to pay for me so I can go go see what it's like. It took me six, yeah. took me sixty years to get there. Okay, it was long, okay. Long flight. Yeah, it was okay. rusty. It's okay. Yeah, I was sixty before I got to go. Oh, but it's going to be good though. It's going to be good. Oh yeah. Uh, so this uh, last fill in the blank. Uh, back to our page. Oh, not that one. <laughs> that was my email. This last <laughs> fill in the blank, which is uh, right here. Uh, there is going to be a future exchange. Whatever we gave up here, we're going to get even better in heaven. Jesus says uh, 30, 60, 100 fold. Some of it we get, to, we get to experience now. You know, the it is now but not yet. We do get to experience some of the pleasures of heaven now. Uh, we do get to experience some of the peace that uh, God's will on earth as it is in heaven. We do get some of that now. 
And, but why is there still tragedy? Why do people still suffer? Why do people still starve to death and they're believers? Well, because it's not yet. It's now, but not yet. It's coming. But in the future, we'll have all of that exchanged and it will be totally now. I love that idea. We will be saved. Okay, questions or comments? Yes. Questions or comments? That's the end of our lesson tonight. We're uh, finishing I'll, a bit early again. I like what we said. Whatever we give up on earth, we get it back so much better in heaven. Yeah. If we could only remember that. <laughs> yeah, I just read it. I read it. There's a devotion thing. And the uh, core of financial sanity is knowing that our money doesn't belong to us, but it's just another thing in our lives given to us by God, but to be used for his purpose and pleasure. That's good. Thank you, Rusty. It's, good reminder. That's a good reminder, Rusty. And, and we'll uh, reward us. Thank you. And thank you, Judy. Right, for that up. We're, we're exchanging now. What we give up now, we get back better. Thank you for my, any other comment or questions? I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, um, what to do is to enjoy what you have right now and not, not be focusing on the, on things like phones and all of that. Because you never know when it's going to be your last day on earth. I think you're right on. Oh, <laughs> right on right on you're, you're nailing it we, we can enjoy what we have but we can also enjoy helping other people have an enjoyable life so we can give up yeah we can enjoy what we have but we don't have to be miserly or seek out you know we can spend our whole life seeking riches christy i think that's what you're going for but we don't have to do that yeah. we, sh we shouldn't do that um, no we shouldn't because the scripture says we're just storing it up for somebody else anyway. So use it for him. Thank you, Rusty, for that comment. Christy, thank you for your comment. You're right on. Amen. Yeah, okay. like, yes? I, I think the, uh, um, the exchange and the deliverance and the death, I, I, I just think about this strong sensation of a baptism. And that moment when you're immersed, maybe your eyes are shut, maybe they're not, but you come out and you take that first breath. And tonight reminds me of that for some reason. I don't, I can't yeah. fathom what heaven will be like, but I remember experiencing that and there wasn't anything more pure than that, that moment. Amen. That was just beautiful. Oh. Yeah. There's something, there's something about dying. you know, there, there's a reason why Jesus gave us that ceremony because we really are spiritually put to death and really spiritually raised to a new life during that moment. So yeah, there, there's definitely something to do that. Thank you, Cecil, for bringing that up. John. Uh, Think about this, uh, my beloved brethren. The baptism is a reenactment of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection to new life. Right on. John, when you, I worked, you sound like when I worked at the guy. hospital yeah. at Clinton Memorial. Do you know him? Never mind. Go ahead, John. When I worked at Clint Memorial Security, there was a young colored lady at the desk. If anybody goes back in history, she wanted to talk to me about it. And I had a chance to converse with her. And I opened her mind when I told her about the gospel and its death. Your baptism is a reenactment of the gospel. There was a colored girl. I can't remember her first name or nothing like that. But anyway, I got to testify to her about it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't understand that it is a reenactment. So, yeah, it's great. Um, I, I think we ought to keep teaching that. Keep teaching that. Thanks, Cecil, for bringing that up. John, thank you for bringing up that uh, idea that we get to reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in the gospel message. One more comment or question or snide remark. Anyone? Uh, we were just uh, doing a devotional with uh, Noggles uh, online, the Bible app, and things like that. And one one uh, verse that came up was Matthew 14, which he feeds thousands with like uh, five five loaves and two fish. And it's amazing how little we actually need uh, to to survive. There's many different books out out there. One was a man's search for meaning. This guy goes through the Holocaust, just surviving with uh, just breadcrumbs in his in his po pocket. Mm -hmm. Yet he finds purpose in life and meaning in, in life. And sometimes we do forget how much you know 
to really just measure life by our sacrifices, not by, you know, wealth or prosperity or achievements or things like that. Just in sheer the amount of sacrifices that we make in, in terms of others. So, uh, Yeah, uh, Brendan, I think you're right on. And then Jesus promises us that those sacrifices do end up with a reward. It's not just a good feeling we get here. It is something tangible we get in heaven. Uh, so yeah, we Jesus says you don't have to work for free. You get to work for a reward. You get to work for that treasure in heaven, which is an, another reason to keep doing it. Uh, but there is we get to experience some of that reward here for sure. Okay, thank you all for your comments. Thank you for sharing. You know, our, um, our salvation, that we have been saved, are being saved, and we will be saved, that kind of leads us to our identity in Jesus. And so when we meet next week um, or the next time we meet, we might take a quick break um, for a couple of weeks. Um, we're going to talk about this salvation now tells us who we are. And who we are now tells us what to do. So we're going to talk about identity in Christ uh, uh, the next time we meet. Thanks for coming tonight. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dale. Thank you. Well, we just finished talking about we will be saved. Next week, we're going to tar start talking about the uh, new identity we have because we are saved in Jesus Christ. So we have been saved. We are being saved, and we will be saved. What does that mean for us? Who does that make us become? And becoming the person Christ wants us to be is even more important than what we do. But our identity does give us purpose, which tells us what to do too. We're going to start with identity next week. We'll see you soon.